All right, everyone, welcome back. Today we're talking about crappy cars, sheepskin seat covers, Count Chocula, and the lost art of eating a pine tree. <laughs> So I'm walking my dog this morning. <laughs> That's always a good way to start. <laughs> Actually walking my dog. Not, not, not as a euphemism as we've discussed previously. So I'm walking my dog and I, as I round the corner, hear the faint, as, and then I got closer, it became less than faint, um, sounds of a car alarm, right? And the first thing that struck me, it was just pretty early, but the first thing that struck me was that it was one of those like old school car alarms right it wasn't just like a, a consistent sound and pitch i could ask you you're the sound effects guy but we'll spare the audience oh come on man come on you can't you can't you can't tee me up like that go ahead hit me hit me with a car alarm So it was, yes, it was one of those old school, wasn't the consistent pitch and tone and then going off and, you know, shutting off. So it was that over and over. And, and keep in mind, again, I turned the corner. I'm still like, I'm probably a qu quarter mile away from this Hyundai Sonata that's got the alarm going off. And um, I'm getting closer and it's still going. And I'm getting closer. It's still going. And Finally, this guy comes outside, probably straight out of bed, because he looked like he came in straight out of bed. He was wearing boxers and absolutely nothing else. It's literally not one of those things you hear every day, right? And it's funny because when the car alarms and you know, when we were kids and they finally became a thing. And I think at, at first it was a bit of a stat, like your car's got an alarm. That was like, a, again, that was like one of those on the status chains, like, wow, how cool is that? And it made me think about Oh yeah. Remember when there was a time that people were concerned about their what getting so their their stereo. Cause their car stereo, again, probably I think it probably which chicken and egg, what came first, the car or the car alarm or the car stereo. But if you had such a cool car stereo, right? You had to protect it. You had to protect your investment because you didn't want to necessarily have to go back to Mad Jacks or back to Dow Stereo or Circuit City or whatever <laughs> you had bought. Now Wow. You a, yeah. You, what do you get? Yeah. You get a standard stereo and maybe it's got some Bose speakers and you run yeah. your Bluetooth through it and you're good to go. But then it was an enormous investment and people would spend, you know, research whether they were going to get, you know, if, if it's, I don't forget what the top level, maybe it was Blaupunk or something like that, which sounded really cool because it was German. Blaupunk. I forgot about that. I, oh my gosh. Is that still around Blaupunk? I don't know. I don't know. But right. But it was like, I, and again, I was the, you know, I was the opposite. I think I had a cheap ass audio vox, which was like a car stereo that you could get at like Pep Boys, right? Yeah, audio vox was like the uh, you know the the worst of the worst. It was just sort of a generic brand. It wasn't it was I guess it wasn't the worst, I guess, but it wasn't very good. Um, and I remember the other big one was uh, Alpine, which I'm sure is around today. That was a oh man, if you had an Alpine, that was a mm -hmm. big deal. You were you were a you were just you know. Right. Loving it and uh, really, really popular. But uh, how weird that your car back in the 70s and 80s, for sure, by the time you got into the 80s, um, it was defined by your damn sound system. You're right. And, it, and Chris, remember, it wasn't just the receiver. It wasn't just the, uh, you know, uh, what was in your dashboard. It was the speakers, right? You had to have these insane speakers. And man, if your friend actually had you know, a subwoofer for God's sake. And it was like, he had shit in the trunk that was somehow loaded back into the car. You're like, oh my God, this car is insane. And you had an equalizer. An equalizer. Oh my God. And like, you knew how to use an equalizer. Like you knew how to get that to sound, you know, so Michael Schenker group or whatever the hell you were listening to at the time and how you could yeah, suddenly everybody's George Martin from the fucking Beatles, right, in their car. And it's just, you know, this is a Volkswagen Bug uh -huh. or a Jetta, uh -huh. uh, a Jetta, right? A yeah. And uh, you know. 
Scirocco. There you go. Uh, a rabbit. Yeah, we just I think we just named all of Volkswagens. You know, and so all those things, all those car things, and and the thing was hilarious. But then again, so you had to protect it because you got you didn't want your Alpine or your Blaupunkt or God forbid your AudioVox stolen. And then eventually, so if you had the alarm, which was like one deterrent, and then they started coming out with like there was this, the, <laughs> which you could pull right, it, you could pull the entire speaker or the entire stereo out. And it it weighed it had a handle and it weighed like about the size of a car battery. So like yeah, let me carry this thing around. Number one, for, for those of you that don't remember that uh, or weren't around at that time, imagine if your uh, your car receiver, you know, the thing that has the the knobs on it, so you can uh, listen to your car stereo. Imagine if it had a little a briefcase handle and you could just yank it out of your dashboard whenever you wanted and then take it with you. And man, there was no better status when you showed up to a party with your friends than you're like, excuse me, everybody, I have to set down my car stereo over here. Yes, it is the removable kind. Thank you. You know, it was just like this big status symbol to yank your car stereo out and shove it back in um, so that nobody would, you know, mess with your car. And by the way, going back to those car alarms, Chris, you're absolutely right. We thought at the time, car alarms were going to save our cars from being stolen. And I guess they did for a while. But but back in the day, people, no car ever had an alarm on it. You had to go to some outside company, to Chris's point, and have it installed. And sure, man, if you had a Ferrari, right, or a BMW, I could see doing that. But man, we all thought that we had to have alarm systems on our car, right? All of us believed that we had to have one. And we got to a point where nobody gives a shit, right? We're now in a world today, guys, where, as Chris said, if you hear a car alarm go off, you not only do you not care, you could literally see someone actively stealing that car and you admit it. You would just keep walking. Why? Because the insurance company will pay for it. No one gives a flying shit anymore about their car. Oh, I have to pay the $500 deductible. Okay, next. Give me a new car. Some people are praying their fucking car gets stolen. So that all <laughs> the just people went upside away. down on their payments or in the sense of like that you would risk right. your life. Yes. Like this morning, if, if I were to see somebody breaking into and trying to steal this Hyundai Sonata, go for it. You know, unless there's a child, unless there's somebody being kidnapped in the back of that Hyundai Sonata, I'm, I'm not getting involved. Right. And I think that's what, you know, the whole thing with the car alarms and same thing with the car stereos. It may, you know, then that, yes, they came out with all these, the deterrents or the deterrents, like the pullout stereos or the detachable face plate. Um, I have two different, I knew somebody who put their, I knew somebody who put their <clears throat> two different people. One put his detachable stereo in the trunk, which actually just made it a little bit easier to get stolen because everything in his trunk got stolen and calling the stereo nice and handy. They didn't even have to break the glass. And, or I knew a person who, who, who drank maybe a little too much or did something and, Anybody seen a detachable face plate around? It was like, okay, maybe you should have put it somewhere a little safer than your back pocket. You know, so it's just, it's hilarious. Um, the, the lengths that we went through, went to at that point for something is really, when you look back at it, go, wow, a car stereo, you know, cause I couldn't, I, I don't give my car stereo any thought these days. I mean, I'm guessing you don't either, you know. I do think there's a return to it. Um, it seems like nowadays, and maybe it's because I travel sometimes to the uh, the East Coast in Florida, Orlando area, but man, cranking your car stereo to decibel levels that shatter glass has, has made a comeback. Uh, so it definitely is still a thing, right? But I think it's only a thing with small subgroups within the uh, quote unquote youth. But uh, yeah, back when we were kids, it was a big deal. And uh, I love the, I love the face plate too. Uh, that's, that's a scenario where, like you said, Chris, you don't have to pull out the whole entire tape deck or whatever. You can just pull out the, the thing that's on the, on the front of it, this little thin face plate. I had a friend, by the way, uh, who had a super cool car uh, Jonathan Schwartz. I think you know who I'm talking about, Chris. I do. We both, we both know him. Um, still really good friends with him to this day. That TR8, that TR8 convertible. Oh my God. His, his dad got him a Triumph TR8. And if nobody knows what that is, imagine a very small, very lightweight British sports car called a Triumph. Um, super lightweight, like an MG midget kind of a lightweight, but 
they they somehow crammed a V8 engine into that motherfucker. So that thing was to say that it was fast was an understatement. And it had British wiring in it, which of course is just a mystery wrapped in a riddle inside of an enigma, right? You could have used mm-hmm. British car wiring to defeat the Nazis back in the day if you had tried. And my friend John, he went in to the a car alarm place to have the car alarm installed. And by the way, that is a car that needed an alarm because it was a convertible. Absolutely. It was British racing green. Everybody would definitely want that car. They fucked up his car so bad on the wiring. My recollection is that John actually had to turn on the windshield wiper in order to start his car. And then later realized, wait a minute, that actually is one of the greatest theft deterrents of all time. <laughs> if you have to fucking turn on the windshield wiper, even if you had a key in your hand, that's a pretty good theft deterrent. Unless it was so, raining, um, unless somebody yeah. happened to steal the car yeah. in the rain, then it was, then it was, that is amazing. Yeah. But I, I think if you look at all those parts of the, again, in, in that time period and um, of all of those things that uh, cars had and that we seem to have moved on from, and again, maybe we don't need like sheepskins, you know, seat covers, which it was like, okay, people had, you know, I guess, and they were actual sheepskin, but we had those sheepskin seat covers or the little wrap that would go around the steering wheel. Um, the louver, like, remember those, I think they were called, they pronounced like louvers. It was like these black sort of ridges that go on the back yeah, window. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. All these things that you would get after market that you would add to your car. Because maybe because we just everybody bought so many cars that didn't have really any bells and whistles. And those are the things that that even an average kid who maybe had a part time job could afford to put on their car. Yeah, but let's talk about louvers for a second, Chris. Louvers were basically just ugly window shades for your car. It was just it was just you couldn't see. Hey, hey, that whole back window. Let's take that back window and put window blinds on it so that now you have zero visibility, but allegedly it's supposed to make your car look cool. I don't know. I never understood the louvers, but uh, they were super popular, especially for Chris. I mean, I think, as I recall, did you not have a car that could have definitely had louvers on the back? I mean, wasn't your car the the kind? Yeah, I did. It was a it was a Toyota. It was a Toyota. It had louvers. Um, I think it had sheepskins and probably the pi- sheepskins, yes. the sheepskin sheep sheep covers, how, how, right. They were yeah. just, they were, they yep. were, and at first they were kind of stiff and like carpet, but after a while they got really soft. They were supposed to make your seats a little cooler. Um, I don't know how that worked because it was sheepskin. Um, I guess it worked for the sheep. Um, and so especially since you had like vinyl seats or whatever, weren't leather seats weren't exactly, you know, really common back in those days. But so the sheepskin seat covers, the louvers, but I think probably my favorite thing on mine was um, was what was unequivocally called a bra. So that went on the front end of the car. It was like a faux leather kind of thing. And you literally wrapped it around the front end of the car, around the headlights. Nice. The bra. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The bra. The car had pop-up headlights, which again... You don't see pop up headlights anymore, I don't think, which were like kind of stupid but super cool at the same time. And right, so yeah. I top those. And yeah. the one thing that I think that I miss maybe the most, I never had a car like this, although I did have a convertible later in life, post high school kind of thing, uh, were the T tops. Like, remember those cars, whether it was like Smokey yeah. and the Bandit, yep. like those were generally, I think, the cars that had those, sure. like the Firebirds and the Camaros. But hey, we're going to take the top. So it was kind of a convertible, but not exactly. And then obviously it was manual. You didn't just push a button but the t-tops so i think theoretically you could have had a car like get this it had sheepskins uh, a steering wheel yep. wrap a bra louvers yep. Yep. and t-tops of course um and then maybe your stereo with a pull out or f- removable face plate t- uh chris i think the only thing you're missing is one of those styrofoam balls from the gas station that you can stick on the top of the antenna right i think other, i mean that's the only additional thing you could put on there and you you nailed it. Why do I have to have a fake leather bra on the front of my car? I don't. It's the dumbest thing ever. It's supposed to, I guess, protect, right? I guess the front of your car or something like that. But really, it was just like against bugs. Yeah, it was it was completely cosmetic. And but it looked yeah. kind of cool, I guess. I don't know. I think I have pictures of mine somewhere. Yeah. But um, cars broke down like all the time. Right. How many, how many times, time. if, if your car didn't break down, you wanted a car, reliable car that would not break down. But 
if you're, you know, but anytime, any trip that you took that was longer than 15 or 20 minutes, invariably on either the way there or the way back, you saw somebody pulled over at the side of the road because their car broke down. All the time to the point where you just stopped helping people. And let's talk about that for a second, because uh, back then, 50,000 miles was a very long way to go in a car. Mm. And I guarantee you by 50,000 miles, your car has broken down in some way, shape or form. It's definitely screwed you up in some way. If, if nothing else, you had an alternator or a generator or a battery problem or a clutch, something yeah. screwed up on you by the 50,000 mile mark. Nowadays, we don't even think twice about a car that has 200,000 miles. It's not even an issue. And by the way, back then, cars would let you know that they were <laughs> shitty because if you dared to get up to 55 or, oh, God forbid, 70 miles an hour, those things were straining. They were so loud. It's like it felt like it was going to fucking fall apart if you had a regular sedan or a regular economy car. You probably couldn't even get it to 80 miles an hour. It felt like it was going to be ripped apart by the wind by the time you got to 70. Um, right? It felt and looked like it was going to explode like the opening credits of the six million dollar man where they show his like it was just right it would definitely start shaking right start like flipping over and then just burst into like a puff of smoke right, that's right and it was you're right i mean tires break everything would be gone tires breaks and yeah. so that point it's like but it's still even a significant investment because you know to fix and the expectations were just so damn low you know, and unfortunately, we lived our lives like that, lives like that in the sense where, yeah, it was the way a car performed or it's something that you ate. You know, if you look at TV dinners or a can of SpaghettiOs or Hunt's snack packs. Oh, my God. Hunt's snack packs. Or Hawaiian punch. I'm thinking, right, all these things that we would consume, right? We would consume because... They were good enough. I'm hungry. I'm going to eat that TV dinner. Guess what? I'm not hungry anymore, right? Or I'm going to have those that, you know, Dolly Madison snack cake, which was like the second tier, right, of even Hostess. If you had like a sort of a Coke and Pepsi oh, battle, yeah. you had <clears throat> Hostess and Dolly Madison. But yeah, Dolly Madison was pretty, pretty good, right. man. That was it was. There. It was good. But, you know, the Zingers, or I think that was Zinger was the popular one. But that was my favorite, the raspberry zinger with the coconut. Right. That was incredible, man. Oh, so you good. Know, so, but again, it was those things. It's not the expect. They were good enough. The cars were good enough because it gets me where I want to go, hopefully, nine times yeah. out of ten. Yeah. And the food was, well, my kids are hungry. I'm going to feed them this. Yeah. We didn't know any better, Chris. And, and, and when you look back on it, there was not one thing in those snack foods or those, uh, like you said, Chef Boyardee or food in a can or um, uh, TV dinners that was even close to nutritional. If you accidentally got a vitamin or some essential mineral out of that, good for you. Back then, they were fully fucking experimenting with chemicals and preservatives to a, to a point where I am shocked that I am still alive to this day. How I am, maybe, maybe it's because I am preserved to some extent, but my God, the chemicals they pumped into that horrific shit. Don't get me wrong. It was awesome. I loved it. We all loved it, but good God, was that bad? Oh my well, Lord. Even, and I think we talked about this before as well as even, even how we kept the food and how we would take, you know, nowadays kids, if, if kids take a lunch to a school in an insulated lunch box with a little freezer pack or a little plastic Tupperware, everything's preserved and, and climate controlled and everything else. And, and we were eating a bologna sandwich that had been in a brown paper sack for probably since the time we left school to the time we ate it, probably four or five hours. Nobody cared about, right, cared yeah, about refrigeration yeah. or contamination or anything. like. No, no. We talked about that, I think, in one of our early episodes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So it's all those things. They, they all kind of they're all connected. Right. Because you just didn't you didn't care about those sort of things. You didn't care as a kid. We don't care. It tastes good. I'm going to eat it. But certainly our parents didn't care or didn't notice. We did draw the line like my mom, my mom being Italian and making her own sauce. I never had. I don't think I was in my 20s before I bought it on my own, before I had like a sauce from a jar, like a pasta sauce or something like that. So I never we, we thought being SpaghettiOs would trying that would be really cool but we never got to do that well and you know back then uh you, you talked about your mom making her own spaghetti sauce or her own sauces 
Um, I, I do remember back in the 70s for sure that my parents, I'm sure your parents and a lot of our parents, they took great pride in their own personal family recipes. That was a big deal back then when it came to food, right? The opposite of the shit you bought in the store, the, all that processed crap. Um, almost everybody had a mom that had family recipes that went way back and and they were super proud of it. And guys, this is before the you know, food network and every five freaking shows being all about food. All they had back then was, uh, what was her name? The, uh, the French lady there, Chris, um, Julia child, uh, right. Child, Julia child's. Yeah. Right. That's about it. Um, but again, um, it was amazing to have your parents, you know, cook actual home cooked meals and you would come home and when you all could get together at the dinner table after the porch lights came on and you came back from blowing up someone's backyard with M80s and barely escaping compound fractures in your leg when you jumped your bike on some construction site that had exposed rebar sticking up and you got down, you sat down to the table and there it was, the home recipe for meatloaf and the freshly made mashed potatoes and all that stuff. And I really think that uh, to a large extent, that whole kind of tradition and that whole kind of like uh, the honor amongst uh, owners of recipes and uh, the the coolness of the recipe book has been kind of lost over the ages. Um, now, then again, I did kind of dig into some of my mom's recipes. And frankly, I would call them semi homemade. <laughs> there was a lot of stuff where it's like, uh, here's my special ingredient. Right. Oh, and then just take a can of this. Uh, right from the store and dump it in there. But shh, okay, now, next step, you know, <laughs> it's like, okay, well, maybe, maybe that's not all from scratch, you know. It, it, it's still kind of impressive, though, because they didn't have uh, the shortcuts, right? There were no, you know, there was no, you know, air fryer, right? Um, we were all, I, I mean, I can remember when we got our first microwave, it was like a big deal, right? I can remember being a little kid and again, before coffee makers and, a big, my mom every morning with this big glass coffee pot and making coffee on the stove. It would wow. be like, yeah, that's how right. you get. And it had like this strainer that you put coffee in. Absolutely. And then I guess the water would boil, I guess. And then I, I don't even remember because that's all, again, it was a long time ago, but making, making coffee on the stove. I mean, that's some, that's some pioneer little house on the prairie shit there. I mean, it it's not quite churning your own butter, but it's pretty close, it's man. I mean, you're right. Close. Yeah, it's old school. It's, well, it it sure as hell isn't a goddamn Keurig, all right. No. It's, uh, <laughs> you're 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 actually trying, you know. I no, I remember that, man. Uh, my mom had the uh, the the metal um, sort of tea kettle slash percolator, and you would stick it right there on the stovetop, and that's how you would uh, make the coffee, and you would see it percolating in the uh, in the white clear knob on the top mm -hmm. of it you would see the coffee right. start to bubble inside the knob which was right. kind of cool and there was no timer there's no setting up no the, timer like now nope. you can set it up the night before and whenever yep. you know you're going to be downstairs the first thing you can do is pour yourself a cup of coffee rather than these people stumbling around with you know with their eyes three quarters closed because they need their coffee but unfortunately they've got to they've got to make that was really making coffee i don't know if these days if putting coffee in a coffee maker, or even if you grind your own beans and pouring water and then pushing the button. I don't know if that's making coffee, right? Any more than like making, you know, like making, making cereal, right? Well, I got cereal, I got a bowl, I got a spoon and I got some milk. Right? Oh my God. And, and Chris, when you think back, man, I mean, we've got some, some pretty good cereal choices these days, but I'll tell you, you know, cereal was a very big deal back in the seventies and the eighties. That was huge billions of dollars in business on getting kids to talk about eating the most uh, amazing tasting but most disgusting chemical mixtures you can imagine my my favorite being i would say i was going to say the trifecta but i believe there was four different versions of it chris correct me if i'm wrong but i'm going into the count chocula world here for a second so count chocula um and as i recall count chocula does have the marshmallows right it's chocolate marshmallows in there am i wrong yep Okay. Yep. And then what is uh, Count Chocula's buddy? We got at least two others that are in the Count Chocula realm, right? He's got the... Uh... Well, there was Frank Frankenberry. Frankenberry. Thank you. Frankenberry. Thank you. And I think there yeah. was also Booberry, which was like... So right. I, I think that... So Frankenberry was obviously Frankenstein. The Booberry was some nondescript nameless ghost, 
right? Unless it was Casper, like with his side hustle or something. So those are the ones I remember. I don't remember the fourth one. I remember Freakies, which were like a, a some sort of weird monster. Or well, something? let's let's put a pin on Freakies for just one second because uh, I also thought it was kind of fun that back then. You and I keep talking about Chris, and this this is a, a theme that we keep bringing up again and again and again. But you and I were exposed to a lot of aging character actors that really started their careers in the 30s or 40s or 50s or whatever, and that was no different with uh, Count Chocula. That was a uh, the voice of Count Chocula was really a takeoff on Bella Lugosi, who right. famously played a vampire in all of the uh, the the movies back then. And then mm -hmm. you had uh, Frankenberry. Who was a takeoff on Boris Karloff's Boris Karloff, voice, right? Right, because right. of course he he played Frankenstein, and then my favorite is Booberry, who was a takeoff on. Do you know the actor that that's a takeoff on? The Booberry Ghost. That is uh, Peter Laurie, and Peter Laurie, if you don't remember, uh, he was in a lot of uh, black and white horror films. He was always the, sometimes the villain, uh, a lot of times the villain's sidekick. Yes, master, and he always he always talked like this. Um, he was in Casablanca, uh, opposite, of course, Humphrey Bogart, Lauren Bacall, and uh, the Booberry character. Yeah, that was definitely a takeoff on that. Obviously, they didn't use his real voice. I'm sure it was uh, somebody doing a characterization of him, but it was, you know, Booberry. Oh, it's frightfully delicious. Yes. Now with blue dye number 419. Yes. By the way, as I'm doing that uh, pretty, pretty bad impression, I'm now realizing that I sound exactly like Montgomery Burns from The Simpsons. And if you're a Futurama fan, I also sound like Kiff. Uh, that is Amy's boyfriend on the show Futurama. So now, conversely, I get it. Those two cartoon characters are definitely based on Peter Lorre. Okay, what was I saying again? That is an outstanding pull. But uh, I, I, I remembered the other one. It was a werewolf. And I can't yes. remember the name of the cereal, but it was fruit flavored was, okay. the, uh, was the gimmick. No, right? and I so. think the thing about this, and maybe that was the first time there was some sort of distinction between a food that maybe, and again, these are all talking about cereals and um, uh, that they, some were a little bit better for you than others. Because I think you can remember that was the distinction. It's like asking, like, can I get, can I get frosted flakes? Right. Can I get frosted flakes? But no, you have to get corn flakes. Of course, if you just add some aftermarket, sugar on your cornflakes and you've got frosted flakes you do well that's right yeah we learned that later yeah you know fruit loops you can improvise you know and like fruit loops no you can't get fruit loops and you can't get cap cap and crunch you know here you can get product 19 a cereal that was so obscure wow. that it, didn't, it didn't even actually have a oh name it's like what, what are we going to call this one let's just it's the 19th version um let's just call it you know call it product 19 that is the nice poll uh, for the entire episode. I'm not sure you can one up yourself on that, but right now I'm going to call it. Uh, that is the the nicest of the polls for this episode. Product 19. I have Product not 19. thought about that cereal since I saw it in the stores back in the 70s or 80s or whenever that was. So, I had it, and yeah. actually not bad. Okay, didn't but it, I mean, it kind of taste like didn't it taste like Wheaties or something like that? Wasn't kind, kind of, of a Wheaties you know, type of see, a, yeah. <clears throat> Right. And see, I think, and that was another thing. It's like when you had your different brands and I know, yes, you know, the, the different brands of cereal, whether it was a Kellogg's or like a Post or a General Mills, and they all kind of had, wow, and nice. like, right. And like Wheaties was like, I think that was a General Mills. And that was all, and what was that? That was the one that was, this was, Hey, you want to be the star athlete and we're going to put Olympic athletes on the box. Right. And the Wheaties and they didn't, and they tasted exactly like you would think. Right. And it was like, you know, if you had your raisin brand, which is like, I'm going to, my kid is so dense. I'm going to slip some fruit, some actual fruit. Although I, I not a big fan of raisins never have been. No. Right. But, you know, I think about it like, ugh, you know, like nothing like floating raisins in milk. Yeah. And so there, some of them were kind of subversive as they tried to get a little healthier as opposed to, you know, I don't know. I think I remember like a, I think I remember the, you know, from the old Calvin and Hobbes uh, comic strip, he used to eat like, I think it was, I think I was paraphrasing here, like frosted coated sugar bombs or something like that was the name of his well, cereal that he ate, Yeah, you know? And it was just like, Hey, I like that because it, it seemed pretty appropriate. Right. Well, I mean, uh, people might think we're exaggerating, but no, there actually was a cereal back in the day. 
uh, sugar pops, right? And this this was back in the 50s where the jingle, the commercial jingle was actually shot with sugar through and through. Shot with sugar through and through. <laughs> that was That was a highlight. That was one of the things they wanted to make sure that you knew before you purchased that. They were actually advertising that. You want sugar, buddy? You fucking got it. And I love what you said earlier about the fact that they tried to differentiate themselves in the cereal business as these are the fun, uh, colored, weird looking uh, pink marshmallows. Of course, you know, the ones that aren't good for you, but we're catering to a certain crowd of bratty, sugary kids like myself. And of course, that would also bring in the peanut butter Captain Crunch, the greatest mm. cereal to this day of all time, in my opinion. Um, Captain Crunch itself, which is basically steel wool for the for the roof of your mouth. You couldn't have more than three bites without having pieces and chunks of flesh just hanging down from the roof of your mouth for the rest of the day um, and just every other thing you can imagine. But then there were the ones that took a chance, right? Like grape nuts. What the fuck? You got to admit, man, a grape nut. They took a big chance with that, right? Because that is just eating gravel. And have you ever seen what happens when you leave grape nuts wet in a bowl for about three hours and it dries out? You have to throw away the fucking bowl, dude. You may as well have just put actual <laughs> cement in there. It is now part of the bowl. It has been used to the bowl. It's drywall. It's it's stucco is what it is. My mom would get incensed. She's like, dude, you wash this. You take a blowtorch to this and try to get that goddamn grape nut off that bowl. Well, you had, well, then also it's like, again, the approach. And I remember the grape nuts and I remember the pitchman uh yule gibbons right who is just oh my this, this, god this, i forgot like, about him old yule in this like old this old dude in a you know flannel shirt like standing in the woods or you know his outside on outside his cabin where he's eating gra grape nuts is like did you just scoop up some like twigs and pebbles you know off you know from right. the base of that tree and add milk um so it's again it's like do you remember his slogan do you remember what he would say when he would start off every everyone uh, every commercial he would start off with? And by the way, everybody, to Chris's point, I love this. It's it's a guy that's like a naturalist, Yule Gibbons, and he's always like Chris said, looks like a lumberjack, and he's out in the woods in in some pine forest or something. And one of the famous things that he would say just to get your attention was, "You ever eaten a pine tree? Well, many parts are edible." But what was he famous for? Right. I it was just know. like I think he was a it's, naturalist it's, or something. Right. And because every means. eleven year old knows what the hell a naturalist is. So and then you're appealing toward the the kid, either the hippies who are trying to feed their kid like really well, or the kid who's grown out of I really like cereal, but I know I can't have frosted coated sugar bombs anymore. Or, you know, because it's it's going from Tony the Tiger to Cap right. Crunch to to Frankenberry to this old maybe he was a survivalist, I don't even know at the time, but like, you know, because it's like maybe if you're not being entertained, right? Right. If it's not a cartoon character, then it's somebody say, then it's yep. somebody it's aspirational. So then yeah. maybe that on the on the you know Wheaties it's you know Pete Rose or something like that on a box of Wheaties. Nobody's a greater inspiration than Pete Rose. What a what a great story, that guy. Yeah. Right. But somebody of that nature, right? It was right. Pete Rose yeah. or Joe Namath or somebody like that on your box of Wheaties. And then it's like, because again, kids want to be, hey, you want to be Billie Jean King, but if you want to be Hugh Gibbons, this literally crusty, cranky old dude in a flannel shirt who lives in the woods and is telling you about eating a pine tree, this is the, this is the cereal you want. So I don't know who they were. Who are you talking to? Who is your audience? Who is your demographic? Obviously, it worked to a certain extent because here we are decades later. I've never had grape nuts. I've never considered grape nuts. I never even Googled at some point, like, yeah, what, well, who was you, Gibbons? Right? Because, again, they had a lot of these guys that were like that. Like we talked about for us that these people who were famous when our kids, when our parents were kids, right, whether it was Groucho Marx or George Burns or somebody like that. And we kind of had this, you know, sort of peripheral relationship and understanding who they were. Well, it's it's hard to say. And I guess we're kids back then. So maybe we're just being kind of like, uh, hey, if I don't know who that is, it must be nobody. Maybe maybe our parents did know. But, you know, right. you brought up a great point, And I think it's really interesting that I never noticed this. All of the cereals that are really shitty for you had very dramatically cool looking uh, cartoon character 
um, you know, uh, iconic, um, Mm -hmm. whatever. I wouldn't call them spokespeople since they're imaginary characters, but all of the really good cereal that tasted the best and was the shittiest for you had a cartoon character, long story short. And all the stuff that was supposed to be good for you always had a picture of either a real person or no, nobody, right? It was because Great Nuts didn't have anybody on there. There was, and, and Life Cereal, another strange Mm -hmm. kind of a cereal, which by the way, to this day is one of my favorite cereals, a really odd cereal, right? Shredded Mm -hmm. Wheat, pretty odd cereal, but man, those are all really good. If you haven't had Life Cereal or Shredded Wheat or Frosted Wheat or Grape Nuts, uh, in the last 20 years, give it a try. You guys, you're going to be shocked how good that stuff tastes, but yeah, it was, um, it was the real, uh, spokespeople that I still laugh at. Right. Because I think on Reedy's boxes, you could have seen OJ Simpson. That's pretty funny. Bruce right? Jenner. Nobody thought, nobody thought that was going to happen. Bruce Jenner. There's one that nobody thought was going to happen. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't think, <clears throat> yeah, it's, I, that those are the ones that sort of jump out to me, you know? Yeah. I didn't realize I had so many memories surrounding uh cereal, but you know, as we were talking about this, uh, Chris, I, 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 uh, I need to go backwards for a second. If you don't mind, mm-hmm. um, I did forget to tell you, uh, what happened to me about four days ago. It's mm-hmm. been about 16 years since I've gotten a speeding ticket. And I did get one. And by the way, I earned this speeding ticket. I was definitely going too fast, but God damn it. My car is electric. And sometimes you look down and you're going fast, but I've driven with you. I've driven. Yeah, with you. So oh, you getting, right. getting a speeding ticket does not seem out of, out of the ordinary, but not a, not a critique, agree? just believable, <laughs> just highly believable. But would you agree with me, Chris, at least that when you were in my car and we were definitely speeding did that car feel like a car from the 70s where it was going to break apart at any second? Or Not did it also surprise you what the speedometer said? No, it, it was very yeah. smooth. It was very yeah, smooth nowadays, and very yeah. quiet, which at the same yeah. time was a little bit disconcerting. But go on. I want to hear yeah, about that's so right. this, okay, so this, this speeding get, ticket that you got. Yes. Okay, so first get, of all, how fast? Let's get the scenario real quick. I know we don't really talk about this kind of thing. How fast and how fast over the speed limit were you? Okay, so the... the uh, Again, I need to paint the picture. This is a very uh, rural uh, road, uh, obviously going in two directions. It's two lanes each way, four lanes. And this is in Temecula. And it's mostly just farmland on each side. Now, why that somehow excuses me from speeding, I don't know. But I will say that there wasn't really anybody around. Again, uh, me trying to get out of this. Um, anyway, so it's uh, I think it's 65 and I was going 92. That's fast. I agree. That's fast. And I don't I don't normally do that. But um, sure enough, there was a cop on my side of the road and he was shooting his ray up uh, his ray gun. I wish that would yeah. be awesome. You, you would have uh, slammed on the brakes. Yeah. Just asked to I was see like, his oh, ray my gun. God. Where did you get that? Uh, he was shooting his. Uh, what radar. do you call it? Radar, radar gun. gun. Thank you. I don't know why my brain isn't working. So he but he was shooting it backwards at me, which I thought was pretty pretty deceptive, right? Because his car was facing the other direction. Anyway, he nailed me. I I, I get it. But um, one of the tickets besides speeding, I could not talk my way out of that one, was uh, tinting. Uh, I had the front uh, windshield, right? Um, mm-hmm. Tinted uh, because I have old man eyes and God dang it, we live here in Southern California and it's just so nice to have a little bit of tinting on that front windshield. But anyway, he didn't see it that way. Now I have to get it removed. And it just reminded me of, again, back in the 70s and 80s, um, no car, ladies and gentlemen, ever came with window tinting. There was no such thing as a car that already had some level of tinting on it, right? You mm-hmm. had to go someplace to get it tinted. And if you could find a place, it was really expensive. So usually what did we do, Chris? We went to... uh Pet Boys, Pet Boys or Cragen or whatever Track it was, Auto, right? Right. Uh, yeah, uh, or, or Sears or something. And we actually bought window tinting film uh, that was the shittiest stuff you can imagine. And we thought that we could put that on our windows ourselves. And what always happened, right? It would you bubble. Were wrong. It would peel. It just looked like absolute crap. We would slice our fingers open with the, with the X-Acto knife. It never looked good. It never worked. Well, I remember the time where I think it was there were different levels of the tinting when like um, 
that I think it's for a safety reason, like for a police officer. Like I get it. Sir, the side, the passenger window could not be tinted. The driver window could. So it's like depending on the. So the windshield that seems I don't know how that would hurt anybody, um, other than the fact that maybe they want to make sure they know there's a person driving it as opposed to it's being driven. You know, whatever. Uh, I think it ends up being one of those laws that, um, like so many, was put on the books for questionable reasons. And now nobody wants to be the person to remove it because they think they're going to face some kind of political backlash. So it just sits there. Um, by the way, uh, sodomy is still illegal in many, many states in the United States. Why is it still illegal? Because nobody wants to be the the congressman or the senator or the local lawmaker that says, I'm for sodomy. Come on, everybody. Let's get sodomy back on the books there. Come on. Um, so anyway, lots of weird stuff. I think out here in Temecula, right. it's still illegal to take a mule into town after 2 PM. Pretty sure that's mm. still on the books. I do remember one time, and again, now we're really getting down a hole. It has nothing to do with our, our normal topics was, so a uh, break in at a mortuary and uh, a couple of these guys, they broke into a mortuary and let's just say they, they, uh, they partied with a couple of corpses and, uh, so you can I'm use sorry, your imagination what? on that. These 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 two these two guys had a good time with a couple of corpses, and they arrested them. Oh my for break- god! They arrested them. Here's the the weird part. Again, they arrested them for breaking and entering, but the actual defiling of the corpses, not a crime. So while it really disgusting and disturbing, um, they walked on those. So they they weren't charges on that. So may, maybe they changed that law again. Do you want to be the guy? bringing that to the state legislature saying I'm proposing a bill outlawing um, sexually abusing a corpse. You know, you like to think you don't need a role on that. I'm so surprised to hear that because normally necrophilia is a pretty stiff sentence. But thank you. Good night. Thank you. See, I, I was not going to use that actual. Oh term. my God. As soon as you said it, I was just drooling to put that dad joke in there. Uh, I mean, you would think it would be a grave mistake, but I guess they, okay. uh, they got off scot free. What am I digging a hole here? Sorry. Yes. It's six feet deep. Yes. You can start. This show took a dark turn. Yes. It did. It did. And it, it started with all window tinting to necrophilia is quite a leap. Okay. I think I'm kind of hungry. I mean, I definitely, I definitely am not going to have a TV dinner. Uh, yeah. There's no SpaghettiOs in the cabinet. Um, we may be running low on milk, so Count Chocula <laughs> is out. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a lot to ponder. Although we again, we did take a certain turn uh, toward the end. So, till next time. Till next time. Yeah.